you know, I've been, uh, I have a number of paragraphs here, just drop it. <laughs> Megan, Megan, how are you? Oh. <laughs> I'm well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Megan and I, we've been, we've been working together for a long time. I could tell you stories, just one, okay? Oh. <laughs> no, no, it's a good one, okay? I have all the good stories, right? <laughs> one, one, one bad story. One, okay, one. You know, I was here and I get an email from Suriname, you know, and, and the, the email, the name is Suriname Princess, you know, so that's the e email address, right? So she writes and says, you know, um, I, I really want to do economics. I've seen you on the web and I would like to study with you. So, and I'm coming, by the way, I'm coming to Vancouver uh, the following week or two weeks and I would like to come and chat with you and say, come over, Suriname Princess. And then I'm in my office and Megan appeared. <laughs> I thought it's some Caribbean lady, right? <laughs> anyway, so that was beautiful. And since then we've been together. She did a master's here, PhD, went off to the Netherlands to do her postdoc and then applied for a CRC and knocked them all out of the competition. And now you are an associate professor at Dalhousie University. She's a Canada research chair. Megan does amazing stuff. And, and, and the thing about, anyway, I should stop here. You get the stage. I, should, <laughs> I remember one of our conversations, Megan said, oh my God, this field is so loaded with heavy weight. So, so how could I ever be like X, Y, Z, right? She named names. Then I said, Megan, you know what? Do you really want to be Mr. X? No, you know, Mr. X is a mathematician, right? Uh, he did his thing in the 50s and 60s. You know, that kind of thing. And you are mega. You have all this background and experience. You've been to Serena. Come and be yourself here. And I think that's what you have done so beautifully well. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. I think you're going to be inspired, okay? Over to you. Pressure is on. Pressure is on. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Rasheed. Hang on. Um, it is a, it's a real pleasure to be back. Um, thank you so much. I gave my master's defense in this room in 2007. <laughs> I was so nervous. Um, and someone from the audience who shall not be named yelled about one minute into my presentation, slow down. I, it was horrifying and embarrassing. Um, so it's nice to be here. That person's not in the audience today. <laughs> um, but to someone I'm still fond. So no hard feelings. Um, so I'm going to be doing something different today that I've never done before. So I'm going to be reading a chapter, uh, the first chapter from a book that I'm working on. I've never read a chapter as a talk, probably because I've never written a book. <laughs> um, so I, I hope that it goes okay. And it's the first seminar of the year. So I feel like if it doesn't go okay, you've got lots of seminars uh, after this one, and you won't have to remember this performance. Um, but saying that, I do also want to say I, I appreciate that I am the first uh, one of the first seminars of the year. So that's a, a really nice opportunity for me. I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, uh, just th giving thanks that uh, and recognizing that we're on Muslim territory. And so thank you for, um, you know, being on these lands today that I can give this talk. I appreciate that. And a little bit of uh, author positionality. So where am I coming from in writing this book and giving this talk? Um, I'm coming from a place of gratitude for a lot of help and support and teaching along the way. I am a white settler academic and I have the privilege of deciding when, where, how I engage in conflicts around environmental justice and indigenous rights. And there are many people that don't have that choice and they don't have that privilege. Um, these are fights that they have to fight every day of their lives. So I recognize that. Um, and I also, I'm not indigenous. And, and so my perspective is one perspective but there are many other perspectives that really should be heard um, in the telling of this, this story. Um, and I have some names here of particular thanks that I'm giving. So um, this project is in partnership with Saginaw First Nation. So thanks to the guardians, Matt Maloney, um, John Michael and Ryan Hamilton, as well as fisheries director, Denise McDonald, legal counsel, Rosalie uh, Francis, chief Mike Sack and lead counsel, um, particularly Brandon Maloney. Uh, thanks to students, Shannon Landowskis, Jade Robinson and Jake Young, who have all worked with me on this project. Um, and then as well to Nadine Peterson from the BC Press for patients now and in the future while I work to finish this. Okay, here we go. So um, chapter one, tinker, feeders, and squishy lobster. In the fall of 2021, I was on board the Mama Ain't Happy, one of Sabaganagany First Nation's band boats. 
That is, it was a boat owned by the band, uh, used to fish their communal commercial licenses, as well as their food, social, and ceremonial inherent rights. I was there sampling lobster that the captain and crew were bringing up uh, using FSC tags, so food, social, ceremonial tags. We were paying particular attention to the size of the lobster, the sex, in the case of females, if she was carrying eggs, uh, as well as the shell condition of the lobster. We were throwing back tinkers, cedars, and squishy lobster. Words that prior to coming on board, the mama ain't happy, I wasn't really familiar with. Lobster in the Maritimes are managed spatially through lobster fishing areas, uh, LFAs. In each LFA, lobster must be of a minimum size in order to be retained on board. Um, lobster that do not reach the size, what I would have called undersized lobsters, um, must be put back to grow a bit bigger before uh, they'll come a meal. There's a tool on board the Mama Ain't Happy. It's used to measure and ensure the minimum size is reached. It's also used to put bands uh, on the lobster so that they don't hurt each other um, in holding and transport and that they don't injure a consumer in the near future. Um, even wearing good gloves did not protect those of us on board from particularly crafty claws. Our hands and forearms were getting pinched all the time. Where we were fishing um, on the Mama Ain't Happy, happy we were off uh, the coast of McKagan in LFA 34. So you can see where that arrow is there. And this minimum size is 82.5 millimeters. So on the first day of sampling, I quickly learned that undersize was not the, the word of choice for the fishermen I was harvesting with. Rather, these were known as tinkers. Minimum size limits are a tool used extensively in fisheries management. We talk about recruitment in fisheries in a couple of different ways. So firstly, we can talk about recruitment of eggs into the population. Um, and we can also talk about recruitment into the fishery. And it's this recruitment that I wanna talk about here. Um, so we want uh, recruitment into the fishery to happen once the species has had an opportunity, the individual has had an opportunity to do its duty to the population, so that is to reproduce, uh, or more pointedly has at least a 50% likelihood of being mature. Basically, um, there's a relationship between maturity and size of the animal, and so we use that size as a proxy for the maturity. Uh, if you are a certain size or bigger, but not too big, um, you can stay on board and you'll be uh, retained. Um, and again, as I was saying, this 82.5 millimeters uh, in this particular region. So we pulled up our share of small lobsters, some of which needed second or third opinions um, to make sure that they met the minimum size. So when in doubt, throw it out or more accurately overboard. In addition for looking uh, for tinkers while fishing lobster, we were also looking for buried females. So these are female lobsters with eggs attached to the underside of their tail. These females are sometimes more affectionately called cedars by fishermen. Cedars are beautiful. One of the first things that you do when you take a lobster out of the trap is you turn it over and you look for eggs. Um, I remember the first one I saw, that's her there. 100,000 tiny eggs that were obsidian black with a hint of green filled every crevice and compartment on the mother's tail, fresh eggs. It's a special feeling to hold that mother and know that you're holding the next generation of lobsters. Cedar, uh, cedars are automatically put back in the water and with only the care that mothers can command. In some places before a cedar is returned to the water, she's denotched. Um, and this entails using a knife or a special denotching tool to cut a small triangular shape out of the second from the right tail flipper. Denotching is not done everywhere in Canada, but probably should be. Because females do not breed every year, denotching protects females in non-breeding years, a harvester who brings her up knows that they need to put her back uh, so that she can breed in the future. Protecting the female breeding population is another important principle in fisheries management. So tinkers and cedars go back, but that's not all. Lobsters have an incredibly interesting life cycle that involves cycles of shell molting and hardening. Uh, lobsters can only grow so much within their existing shell and they must shed that shell in order to continue their growth. Younger lobsters molt more often than older lobsters. And right after the molt, lobster shells are incredibly soft and lobsters tend to seek shelter and protection. Within a few days, they begin to harden up and the lobster needs sustenance to rebuild its shell. The shell will remain squishy for a period of time, days to weeks. And during this time, the lobster tends to explore for food and therefore exhibits high catchability. That is, if you put a trap in the water, you're likely to catch that lobster. High catchability means that soft-shelled lobsters and squishy lobsters, they do come up in lobster traps. Fisheries and Oceans Canada, DFO, the federal ministry mandated with the management of marine fisheries across Canada, has a scale that's used to indicate the hardness of the shell. So if the scale runs from one, which is virtually no shell, a lobster that's just molted, to a seven, which is a shell that's splitting across the back, the lobster is about to molt. 
Anything above a two, um, a shell that can be compressed in areas B and C of the lobster can be kept in the commercial fishery. So every time you're handling these lobsters, you're kind of squeezing at different parts of its shell. <clears throat> Onboard, the mama ain't happy while measuring for size, sexing, sexing for lobsters, looking for eggs and bee notches and noting shell hardness and returning some lobsters to the ocean. We record all of these observations and sample sheets attached to a clipboard. Our pace is fast. The traps are bringing up lots of lobsters and this is a good thing. The deckhands are moving the lobsters from the traps um, to sampling bins on the boat uh, and the captain's keeping the boat in good position to draw up the hydraulics and to keep everyone on board safe. As the traps are emptied, they're rebated and they're stacked at the stern of the boat, ready to be redeployed in the same location or a different location. We're sampling in late September and the weather is great. I grew up in Ontario and went to graduate school in British Columbia. I can confidently say that at least compared to where I have lived elsewhere in Canada, the Maritimes has the best autumns. Oh, <laughs> for people on Zoom, there's some groans from the audience. Uh, partly cloudy skies and calm waters, along with an incredibly warm, friendly, and sarcastic crew make for enjoyable work. Music plays on a small portable speaker, and we sing, rap, and dance while we work. 100th Meridian by the Tragically Hip is the first song I hear when the hydraulics start humming. I pull out my camera to start video recording. There's some waiting and singing along to Gord Downey, but not too long. For once the lobsters start coming up, we want to move them through sampling as quickly as possible. Firstly, because the longer the sit in bins, the warmer they get. And for cedars, for example, we really need them back in the water as soon as possible. But secondly, because being on the water can be dangerous. Uh, and for Sabag and Agate harvesters, these risks are greater than just what the ocean uh, and mother nature can bring. So as researchers, Sabag and Agate guardians and harvesters work together as a team, moving the first 200 lobsters of each haul through sampling. I'm joined the, throughout the week by different guardians and Dalhousie students. So Bag and Agate guardians, Matt, John, and Ryan are uh, tasked with the large amount of responsibilities, including the science work we're doing this week, but also including logistics in terms of moving trucks and gear to make them available for harvesters across Mi'kmaq, uh, as well as across seasons and locations. They're responsible for the safety of harvesters on the water, sometimes having to patrol in a zodiac to protect harvesters from violence and racism. And sometimes taking the zodiac out in emergencies to aid harvester who's encountered an issue on their boat. Because of the ongoing interference by DFO in the commercial sector, the community moved a trailer onto Sonyaville Wharf for the guardians to sleep in, thus requiring them to trade off shifts all day and all night to keep uh, their harvesters and community members safe. These duties meant their time to conduct science for the study in the summer of 2001 was quite limited. The sampling protocol we were using that September was based on DFO's own lobster sampling protocol. So with this team of research assistants and the guardians and the fisheries manager, we revised the sampling program as part of a conservation study launched by the band in uh, 2021 in April. The band had been trying to assert their treaty right to fish for moderate livelihood for the past couple of years, and in doing so had been met with violence from the commercial industry and infringement of that right by DFO. The reason DFO used for infringing on the right was that conservation of the stock was a concern. This is despite the fact that lobster populations in this area are at a near all time high. The argument was made that fishing outside the commercial season, which the Baganagadi was doing, was more harmful than fishing inside the commercial se season which in this area happens between late November and late May. To date, and to my knowledge, DFO has presented no evidence to Sabag and Agadee that their fishery is detrimental to lobster. DFO did present a document justifying the current seasonality of the commercial lobster fishery across Atlantic Canada. But this justification focused mainly on generalities of lobster biology and manageability of the fishery, as well as the goals around economic value. DFO highlights that seasons help to protect important uh, molting and reproductive stages, uh, and they help to keep fishing mortality moderate. For example, the document briefly summarizes that handling soft-shelled lobsters can increase injury and mortality, and states, quote, in most lobster fishing areas, the current fishing season takes place outside of this more vulnerable time, end quote. But it begs the question, if soft-shelled lobsters are being put back, how many of those returned do die? How many survive? To answer this, we would look at something aptly named post-release survival. So lobsters are hard shelled and they lack a swim bladder, um, which means when they are returned to the water, they're likely more uh, able to survive than some fish species would be. But how does that vary with shell condition? Do lobsters released with a shell condition of two have a lower post-release survival than those with a shell condition of three? And if so, how much lower? Does that mean they can't be fished at all? 
Well, we know that that's not true because we actually do have LFAs open during this sensitive time. And in fact, lobster are already molting in May in LFA 34 when the commercial fishery is still open. CFO's justification also includes the desire to keep fishing mortality moderate. Seasons make sense when you have almost 400,000 traps that might get dropped into LFA 34 every day. But in 2020, Sabag and Agatee was only fishing at first 250 traps. Is there data to suggest that a fishery operating that scale is mortality above and beyond moderate? In the fall of 2020, many fisheries experts spoke about the lack of conservation concern they felt should be associated with the Sabag and Agatee fishery at the scale of one to two orders of magnitude below the commercial fishery. Dr. Aaron McNeil, a Dalhousie biologist, said the additional effort was, quote, a drop in the bucket. It's not even relevant, end quote. Dr. Robert Stenick, an ecologist at the University of Maine with decades of experience studying lobster, said, quote, I would love to see a study that would look at coves where Sabag and Agatee are fishing, a before-after control impact study. I'd be willing to bet you a beer there'd be no effect relative to the control areas that are being fished, end quote. Yet despite these opinions and others, DFO has continued to maintain that conservation is the reason Sabag and Agatee's right for being infringed on. But going back to Dr. Stenick's point, are there no data around what the impact of fishing outside the commercial season might be? Why is that? Let me take this opportunity to say here that for all intents and purposes, Atlantic lobster fisheries are well managed. They're a management success story. The fishery is managed as an input regulated fishery. So the number of licenses and traps are limited, but the catch is not. You put your set number of traps in the water and catch as many lobster as you possibly can. This fishery has provided jobs and income for harvesters across rural Atlantic Canada. It's also created inertia and a feeling that the way the fishery has been managed in the past and the way that benefits have been distributed is the right way. Right way. Um, but this may not be so, and despite good yields and high value, there remains uncertainty around lobster fisheries. Indeed, there's very little known quantitatively about how impactful a summer fishery compared to a winter fishery might be. Note that these are terms often used in the media, but they don't really represent when fishing is occurring. A commercial fishery opens in late November, fall, runs throughout winter, and closes in late May, spring. That year, Sabag and Agatee communicated their interest in fishing from June to October, so spring, summer, and fall. Given what we know about lobster, notably that they molt and breed in the summer months, it can be deduced that fishing in the summer may impart some mortality on lobsters that is above and beyond what the same amount of fishing may impart in the winter months. But at what scale? How many summer lobsters could you catch before you negatively impacted the reproductive potential? So scale matters and relative impact matters. Perhaps shockingly, neither of these two uh, major dimensions have been studied. This is for two reasons. Firstly, in fisheries management, uh, management largely unfolds using science that's conducted with, with fishermen themselves, so fisheries dependent data. So this could be by having scientists on board fishing boats while the commercial fishery is operating or having commercial harvesters themselves submit their logbooks. Conversely, very little data are collected outside of the fishing season. In LFA 34, there's a summer trawl fishery that DFO runs and they bring up um, biomass from the bottom of St. Mary's Bay one day a year. Um, secondly, we tend to do the bare minimum when it comes to data collection around healthy populations. So if there's lots of lobster, just keep doing what you're doing. And there are lots of lobster more in chapter six. So we'll continue collecting almost exclusively fisheries dependent data and investing nothing in collecting other data or exploring alternative management regimes. Given this lack of evidence, Sabag and Agatee took it upon themselves to launch a conservation study whereby they would collect data as part of their moderate livelihood or treaty fishery, chapter three. I was hired to lead it. Hired may be the wrong word actually. And it's important to note that I received no financial compensation for leading the study. I'm employed as an associate professor at Dalhousie's Marine Affairs Program. It's a publicly funded job. I took on leadership of the Sabag and Agatee Lobster Conservation Study as part of my portfolio of work related to fisheries economics, fisheries management, and marine governance. The goal of the study was to help establish a sampling pro uh, program within the band in hopes of ascertaining some measure of relative impact of the band's fishery on lobster populations in LFA 34 and St. Mary's Bay. It was important in developing the study that ownership of the process, data, and results remained with Sabag and Agatee, and that also band members collected the data. To that end, we attempted to two simultaneous programs. Onboard sampling, like what we were doing with the crew on Mama Ain't Happy, which would be led by the Spag and Agony Guardians, as well as logbooks that individual captains could fill out. For the at-sea sampling, guardians were trained by the Fisherman and Scientist Research Society, who trains harvesters and conducts sampling programs across Atlantic Canada, particularly in Nova Scotia. Our research team developed the sampling protocol. As was mentioned, it was based on DFO's protocol. 
And the hope was that anyone fishing under treaty or FSC traps in St. Mary's Bay would report data consistently. And this could be used for future analysis and for self-governance of Sedaganagadi's fishery. Our hope was that guardians could go out with harvesters throughout the fishing season and sample individual lobsters for sex, size, and shell condition, giving us an idea of what fishing looks like from June to October. For harvesters, a logbook was developed, again modeled after the DFO logbooks, but simplified as only one area was being fished, St. Mary's Bay. So spatial resolution was different and things like bycatch and species at risk didn't need to be noted. Captains would be asked to fill out their logbooks every day that their vessel was, treaty, was fishing treaty or FSC tags, take a photo of their data sheets and submit them to the guardians. Because molting happens in warmer waters, captains would also be provided with a small temperature logger that can be attached to one of the traps and be asked to record its deployment and retrieval depth. And the locations of that in the logbook. In order to do this sampling, a scientific permit from DFO was required. I applied for one. I was told that only lobster fish with FSC traps could be sampled. DFO would not sanction the scientific studying of lobster fish with treaty tags. Our ability to collect data was therefore substantially limited for any community, community member fishing with treaty tags was not allowed to have guardians on board sampling. In April of 2021, the announcement by Sabaganag, that's my son, Chris, <laughs> he's now eight. Um, the announcement by Sabaganag Chief Mike Sack that the band would be opening their fishery and launching the study was met with large media coverage. I was there for the presser itself where the announcement was made and I was asked to give a few words. I took about five minutes to share with the media that we know surprisingly little um, about what a summer fishery might mean. I was clear that this wasn't a criticism of DFO, but just an observation of the way we tend to collect data. I specified we're hoping to review where these data gaps were, some of them I mentioned earlier, develop a community-led sampling program, and also explore alternative governance models um, to allow for treaty fisheries and seasonality. Uh, <laughs> because so little was known, I thought that any data collection would be a win-win-win for the band, for DFO, and for commercial harvesters. If harvesters were so sure that fishing outside the commercial season was a bad idea, wouldn't collection of data to address this be a good thing? After the story broke, I received numerous emails, tweets, and Facebook messages from an angry commercial sector, frustrated that the band was choosing again to fish outside of the commercial season in St. Mary's Bay under the banner of treaty rights. This reaction was not unlike what I received in the fall of 2020. Although Sedag and Agati had launched a small moderate livelihood in the fall of 2019, their larger and highly publicized launch in September 2020 drew national and international coverage, in part because of the response by the commercial sector there was violence on and off the water and harassment by DFO. Headlines such as chief assaulted, flares fired, and lobster pound burns to the ground spread quickly and international condemnation for Canada's treatment of Mi'kmaq and indigenous peoples more broadly was strong. That 2020 launch and the media in it, interest in it and the response from the commercial sector is in part why I ended up leading Sedag and Agony's 2021 study. On the morning of Tuesday, the 22nd of September, uh, of 2020, I answered what I thought was a scientific question on CBC's information morning. Portia Clark asked me live on air if I thought the scale of Sedaganagadi's livelihood fishery, then 250 traps was a conservation concern. I said unequivocally, no. 250 traps is less than one one thousandth of the effort that's operating in the winter and less than one one hundredth the effort that's operating in that particular area of the bay. This science question seemed like a no-brainer for me, and indeed, as I indicated earlier for other scientists that also spoke up, but it turns out the question I asked was not a scientific question, it was a political one. For the commercial industry, concerns over what fishing outside the commercial season might mean for future harvesters was expressed, and not in relation to 250 traps, but to thousands of traps, um, real and potential, in what they saw as an unregulated fishery, not subject to the management measures that they had to endure. Importantly, many Indigenous rights-based fisheries are managed, okay? So they're not unregulated. So Baganagdi First Nation has had an FSC management plan for 20 years, and they worked to finalize a draft fisheries management plan for the launch of their treaty fishery. But from the commercial sector, there was a feeling of unfairness. In my opinion, the risks to the lobster sector were over-sensationalized in the media, but part of that was amplified by the fact that there had not been much information about what livelihood plans looked like about where they would operate, or what times of the year that they would operate. And there were no projections, 10 minutes? 
Perfect. There were no, <laughs> thank you. We didn't talk about that I was getting a hand signal, so I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> and no information about the protected, projected scale at what times of the year uh, they would operate. Sorry, um, no projections on the likely impact to lobster populations if we add all of the moderate livelihood or treaty fisheries together. So there are many Mi'kmaq communities across Mi'kma'ki who are exercising this right. This lack of transparency and coordination did lead to an environment of fear and uncertainty around the commercial sector. And this boiled over into unforgivable and inexcusable behavior. I was also asked uh, in that CBC interview if I supported the moderate livelihood right. I said, of course, but it struck me as another no brainer. Like it's not a right one has the choice to support or not. Do we go around asking people if they support human rights? No, the rights are, the treaty right is. But I was naive and what followed that interview and a subsequent CBC article was a month long email, Facebook and Twitter onslaught from angry Nova Scotians, many of them harvesters. Some of the emails did not recognize or support the treaty right, but other messages, messages did um, indicate that they did support the treaty right, but with a but. And here I summarize some of those buts. I support treaty rights, but not if they fish outside the commercial season. There are biological and economic reasons to prioritize harvest for hard shelled lobster, which generally happens in the colder months. And it may be that that is where communities end up going. But it's important that to all of this, it's a choice for each community to make in developing their own plans. What makes the most sense for their community members? What is safe? What is sustainable? What is profitable? But I also think it's important to remember when we talk about seasons, we talk about commercial season. What is the Mi'kmaq season? And the Mi'kmaq season was the summer. Mi'kmaq were semi-nomadic and they would travel down the Shubenacki River, for example, uh, fish in the summer and then travel back up the river and hunt in the winter. Uh, so I think we need a little bit more of a discussion around what a season is. I support treaty rights, but why do they need a moderate livelihood fishery if they have communal licenses? So in this particular table, it's showing how licenses are distributed across lobster fishing areas. So you can see the LFAs down the left column, 27, 28, et cetera. Um, 34 is the LFA that I've been talking about. And in the blue box, it shows the number of communal commercial licenses that uh, First Nations communities have. So one major form of access is through these communal commercial licenses. It was created by DFO following the Marshall decision, a Supreme Court case where Donald Marshall Jr. challenged the Canadian government over his rights and the rights of all Mi'kmaq to fish without a license based on the treaty right, specifically based on the peace and friendship treaties of the 1700s and, and treaties from the treaty from 1760, 61. Communal licenses were born out of a buyback scheme whereby DFO bought out commercial licenses from non-Mi'kmaq harvesters and gave these to Mi'kmaq communities to use as they saw fit. But each band could use the licenses to earn royalty by leasing out that license to someone else. And then these royalties generate good revenues for the community that are reinvested back into community projects. The idea in this question is that surely if bands have access to this kind of money and these kinds of licenses, then they don't need a treaty right. But the treaty right is more about an individual's right to earn a moderate livelihood from the land and the sea. It's not about being managed what's best for the community. The existence of communal licenses do not negate or in any way remove the necessity and the existence of the treaty right. And finally, I support a treaty fishery, but where do the benefits go? At its heart, this is the completely wrong question to ask. We do not ask commercial harvesters to let us know how they spend their money. And there's a lot of money being made. You can see in LFA 34, and this is the landed value by LFA, it is the most uh, profitable of the lobster fishing areas. There's some expectation in this question that non-Mi'kmaq Canadians have a right to oversee how Mi'kmaq harvesters spend their money. Specifically, I received the following question in an email, quote, how does anyone know that the people fishing for moderate livelihood need to be? Will their incomes be posted so everyone knows they have no choice but to fish for lobster, end quote. There are two, probably more, huge issues I take with this line of argument. Firstly, it's racist, colonial, and paternalistic to think that Mi'kmaq know better, non-Mi'kmaq know better than Mi'kmaq how they should spend their money. But secondly, it's all of these things to think that a treaty right must be linked to poverty. If Mi'kmaq are thriving economically and culturally, should their treaty right be negated? There were many days I questioned answering that CBC call. I felt responsible in some ways for inciting anger and rage and argumentation. In fact, I was told by colleagues in the fishery, consultants and fishermen both, that my name had become a trigger. My name was banned from being mentioned in Lobster Association meetings, as you can see in this Facebook post. I also had misogynistic YouTube cartoon videos made of me. But I realized that this has nothing to do with me and has everything and very little to do with lobster. 
Lobster is a stage it's playing out on, even though the treaty right does and should extend to under other fisheries. But I did answer that call and my media presence throughout the fall of 2020 is what motivated Sabag and Agony to reach out to me in the winter of 2021. Um, but I again made the foolish mistake that I'd be doing science. Surely everyone recognized that we, <laughs> that we needed data from fisheries operating outside the commercial season in order to say anything about the impact of those fisheries. Surely everyone agreed that more data is better and support for the study would be far and wide. Instead, science turned to politics and questions arose about who has the right to do science, chapter eight. After the study was announced and my role in it, my credibility was attacked. I was threatened and my department and faculty received complaints that I was a bad scientist and they would never send their children to Dalhousie. On April 21st, I received an email that included the following line, quote, blood will be on your hands when we, the commercial fishermen, put a stop to an illegal fishery again. Back on the Mama Ain't Happy, we continued to sample under a warm autumn sun. Throughout the week, we saw a change in the catch where the proportion of tinkers and squishy lobsters was increasing and hence the amount of lobster that would be back to, brought back to community was decreasing. This was due, the crew told us, to the fact that we had been fishing roughly the same spot for long enough. We were starting to recapture the tinkers and the squishy lobster and had basically fished this spot out of the big hard lobsters. Time to move on. They did note, however, that the commercial fishery was about to open in two weeks out of Digby in LFA 35, and that the squishy lobsters we were throwing back would not meet the same fate a few miles to the northeast. Some of the crew I was working with also fished commercially, and when we were done sampling in St. Mary's Bay, they'd be spending the next couple of weeks preparing their vessels and gear and readying for the opening of LFA 35. Rather than being thrown back, these lobsters did meet the DFO criteria for hardness and would be retained and sold. But this weird blending of fisheries for food, profit, livelihood, this is known to lobster. They don't care what your trap tag says. From an ecological standpoint, what's important is the overall mortality of the fishery and how that mortality is likely to impact future generations of lobster. Yet what matters to harvesters is how that mortality is likely to impact future generations of harvesters. And so from a social standpoint, what's important is the overall benefits creation of the fishery and how those benefits are distributed among different users. There's a fear that making space for a treaty fishery necessarily means a loss of access for commercial harvesters, and this might be true. So how can the commercial sector prepare for that? How can treaty fisheries be managed in a way that supports prosperous commercial harvesters? Why does DFO say they're okay with a food fishery, but not a treaty fishery in August? And the tag doesn't matter, the catch does. This chapter has raised many questions, questions we'll explore in this book. Many of these and more, may not be answered adequately as this is only one uh, exploration. There are many perspectives on how best to recognize and implement the treaty right for moderate livelihood. My perspective is based on a combination of my academic experience and my personal journey, navigating through the complex politics of lobster access in Mi'kmaq. My journey also included making mistakes, speaking when I should have been listening and has required a lot of help and support by family, friends and colleagues, many of, of whom you will get to know in this book. Importantly, I'm not Indigenous and I cannot understand what it is to have to fight for my rights every day. Many of us take our rights for granted. We trust that our government will deliver on their promises. I know I do, but there are human and Indigenous rights across this country that are not being delivered on. My hope is that by exploring ways forward for lobster fisheries, we can start to recognize that actually this story is not about lobster at all. But by supporting treaty rights and all of the imperfect ways that they may be implemented while trying to get it right, we're honoring the foundations of Canada and what it is to be Canadian. That's what this story is about. We are all treaty people. Thank you. The weird thing about uh, reading a book chapter is that there's a lot that I haven't answered in the book chapter because you know you're supposed to read the book. So you can ask questions about the presentation, but you can also ask any other kinds of questions. Um, about the science generally, or about partnering with the Dagnagity, that process, um, anything that comes to mind. I should make, yeah, audio book to come, 2025. I actually did, I, I did an audio recording of this first chapter for Amanda's class uh, last spring. Um, and I thought that was a good, yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to play this and think about it. And yeah, not always on paper necessarily, yeah. Yeah, thanks. The question was from William Chung, and the question is around um, my experience in, you know, science maybe being ignored um, is not unique, and that this plays out in climate change politics, for example, all the time. And so, what do I see as as pathways forward um, 
this is for folks on Zoom, but for those in the room that definitely heard William's question, um, as getting around this kind of the lack of credibility that that science sometimes has. Um, and, you know, I, I was going through my email, so I kept, you know, all the correspondence I got in 2020. I was going through it all when I was writing chapter three. And I had this beautiful exchange with fishermen who, who wanted, so non-Indigenous commercial harvesters in that area who wanted to be a part of joint data collection, right? And they said, you know, harvesters are not going to believe the data if they're not a part of the data collection, the same way that First Nations community members might not believe the, the data that the fishermen are, are harvesting or are recording, right? And so I do think cooperation and collaboration, joint vessels where people can sample together are going to be really important. And I also feel like capacity sharing and mentorship is really important in the fishery. And it's a, it's a, it's a competitive industry, right? So we don't have that. Um, but I think, you know, there's so much kind of vitriol online around who knows more, who's actually been fishing those waters longer, who's caught more. And instead of positioning that way, I wish that we could, we could learn together, right? And say, well, you've, maybe you, you as an individual harvester have only been fishing your treaty right for a few years. Let me tell you what we've seen in the Bay for 20 years, right? Uh, let's talk about this together. Um, so hopefully, I mean, I know this, you, you should have got the sense throughout the chapter that I'm naive and that you think I would learn from that, but I don't. <laughs> so I still hope that there's kind of these opportunities for collaborative vessels and data collection and a room where people can talk about the data together, collect the data together and talk about it together so that it's not one side versus another putting out, you know, um, data or facts that uh, contradict one another. Thanks for the question, Megan. Um, Megan. Um, there's a question from Carl that was posted in the chat box. I don't know if you can read it or otherwise I would ask Carl to unmute um, and uh, to ask it live. Yeah, let me ask it, Megan. There's, I think one of the things that's hiding behind the fear by commercial fishermen and others about First Nations fishing rights in general is that some of the First Nations populations are growing very rapidly. So over the long run, there has to be some kind of process that that limits fishing effort and limits access. What do you see happening in your situation if a whole lot more people decide that it's a great way to get a moderate livelihood? Thanks for that question, Carl. Um, so the beginning of the question was uh, well, people in the room couldn't hear it, but I think they did eventually, eventually hear it, which is, you know, scale changes. <laughs> so 250 traps uh, in 2020 with 750 traps a week later and with 5,000 traps maybe a few months later or the next year, right? And that's one community. There are multiple communities fishing in the same areas across Mi'kmaq. Um, and so, and also those populations are growing. So how do we deal with, with the, the expansive nature of that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so there's a couple things. Firstly, again, the, the livelihood right is not about lobster, right? So there are lots of fish species that we fish. There are lots of invertebrates that could be brought in to fisheries. Um, and so there's also land-based like hunting activities. So moose, for example, in Cape Breton. So there's lots of, this, this really is a, an idea about a portfolio of treaty rights, right? Or of, 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 um, of species and seasons, et cetera, that you could be working through the land and the sea. Blueberry harvesting, for example, um, is one that comes to mind. So I think because this focus has been particularly on lobster, lobster is really great because you don't need a large vessel. Um, so some of these treaty, uh, boats and FSC boats are quite small, right? So the capital investment is small. So what are other fisheries that you don't need a giant offshore boat um, to harvest? And are those species that we can think about adding to this portfolio of, of a moderate livelihood? I think that's a, a question. And this is a giant, I mean, so you, yeah. I'm trying to, trying to figure out how to use, how to use my words here, <laughs> which is that if people have access to good jobs, if people are socioeconomically strong, right? So, like it may not be that the fishery is where everybody wants to spend time and make money, but actually there is so much economic depression in a lot of communities that there are actually very few options sometimes for employment, right? So being out on the land, being on the water, there are really big benefits to that. Um, so I think we have to think about the moderate livelihood and the earning of money and employment and jobs in a much larger socioeconomic context for Indigenous peoples across Canada. Because otherwise, yeah, lobster fisheries, you know, that shouldn't be where our sole investment is um, in supporting this treaty right. Thanks, Murdoch. It's really nice to see you too. Uh, Murdoch's question was around the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, so there are 
you know, First Nations Fisheries operating out here. Um, you know, why is the news coming out of the East Coast and Mi'kmaq particularly so much more um, violent than what happens here? And I've never thought about that question, so I really appreciate it. But I am thinking about a conversation that Carl and I had yesterday around consolidation and quotas out west versus out east. So on the east coast, you know, the, the fishery is the single largest employer across the maritimes when we look at kind of fishing and processing and logistics. And there are over 10,000 independent uh, operator lo lobster harvesters. And it's very different on the west coast with the quota fishery, right? So the number of actual individuals fishing is very different and it's a lot more companies and consolidation and, and ownership are by the, so it's a bit less diffuse and and so out east you have every single individual and there are <laughs> tens of thousands of them have an opportunity as an individual to voice their concern or be upset right and i just think it is a little bit different here um that would be one kind of a quick reflection but i i'd be curious if there's anyone else that has ideas around that because it's uh to be quite honest um you know, I left here in 2012 and I did very little learning or homework while I was here um, in relation to the first peoples of this area. Yeah. And it, 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 my work was, my work was not here. I did most of my work in Western and Central Pacific, which doesn't excuse the lack of attention that I paid, but I didn't, I, I did live here, but I really just didn't, I didn't pay attention to it. Um, and it's in my face every day. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Megan, you can hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to say um, Ninas. Um, Ninas means you are a good person in Niska. It's our typical greeting. And I just wanted to, to share with you that, yeah, it just means a lot to have you step into a really difficult space and that you're you're taking that burden off a lot of your partners. And so just want to thank you for for doing that really like good and hard work. Um, and as you've had to handle yourself in these like incredibly challenging and uncomfortable spaces and do so with grace, I'm just curious what, you, what you've learned in terms of protecting kind of your own well-being. What would you recommend to other students who find themselves, um, other students, other faculty members, other staff who find themselves kind of in those really uncomfortable positions, what do you do to, at the end of the day, feel okay and be well and continue in, in your good work? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea, for your kind uh, comments and for your, for your question. Um, and if those in the, the room didn't hear it, it's, it is a question around like personal resilience, <laughs> professional resilience in, in all of this. Um, I ended up so in the fall of 2020, I know Catherine, you said quick, so I'm going to try to make it my answer quick. So in the fall of 2020, after receiving, you know, six weeks of vitriol and I was crying all the time, I was on parental leave. My mother had just gone through medical assistance and death. She died a month before. Um, and I, it was like the worst. I had a new baby. I was on parental leave. <laughs> so it was like an incredibly challenging um, six weeks of my life. And um, I just stopped. I got off Twitter. I stopped doing media requests. I had to just say, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And, and that was, I felt like I had been bullied out of it and I hated that because I, it shouldn't be that way, right? So what I would like to see is a bit more, you know, protection from my university. I had no handling of how to handle the media. Some of my requests or some of the, the, the terrible stuff I got, you know, it was reported to the RCMP. There was no Follow up. There was nothing from my unit. Like there's, it was. I just felt very alone. Um, so I think universities are learning how to handle this as well. So I'm not blaming Dell at all. Um, but I don't have media training. I don't. I didn't know how to do any of it. So you know, I feel like having a bit more of a community within the university of how to because the more that we try to engage in these issues, it's not going to get easier really soon, right? Um, so how do we kind of you know protect each other and heal each other and and offer you know, opportunities to, to share and grieve and celebrate. Academia is such an independent endeavor. It's a lonely, isolated endeavor. And I don't think that's the way to do this kind of work. Um, thanks that's great. Time. Thank you, Megan. And if I might just quickly insert that we do have history of like fisheries violence on the West Coast as well, all tied up in the fish wars in, in the 70s throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I'm happy to point folks to some of those resources, but certainly that context that you mentioned is 
absolutely a big distinction between the East and West. Out here on the West Coast, we're working on a project called Fish Outlaws that centers on the criminalization of indigenous fisheries. And I'm gonna put a link to uh, material there in case that's of interest to, to folks. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. And thanks everyone for your attention and, and the questions. Thank you. Thank you.